Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Isabel Lilias and I'm one of the Ath Fellows this year. On the world-renowned series, Game of Thrones, each child of the Stark family has their own direwolf. The sigil of House Stark, the direwolves are both companions and protectors, both weapons and friends. In reality, these direwolves are played by trained wolf-like dogs, particularly Siberian Huskies. After shooting, the producers then use CGI to make these dogs look bigger and even more wolf-like. When these creatures show up on the screen, for me it is almost impossible to imagine how an animal that large and that fierce can be tamed to have the same tempera temperament as my family's tiny, affectionate two-year-old Shih Tzu named Linus, who always snuggles up to one of us and naps whenever our family watches Game of Thrones. Today, when we think of evolution, we think of artificial intelligence, cloning, and designer babies. When we think about scientific development or discovery, we assume that these innovations and findings are driven by technology. But our speaker tonight will talk about his involvement in the process of recreating evolution without high-tech machines or artificial manipulation, but this time with foxes instead of wolves. Lee Dugatkin is a professor and university scholar in the Department of Biology at the University of Louisville. He is a behavioral ecologist and a historian of science, and his main area of research interest is the evolution of social behavior. Professor Dugatkin is the author of a number of popular books, including How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog, Mr. Jefferson and the Giant Moose, and The Altruism Equation. He is also the author of two textbooks, Principles of Animal, Animal Behavior and Evolution, and is a frequent contributor to the Wa Washington Post, Scientific American, and Psychology Today. Professor Dugatkin has spoken at over 150 major universities all around the world, including the University of Copenhagen, the University of Chicago, the London School of Economics, Oxford, Cambridge, Cornell, and Harvard. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please silence and put away your mobile devices at this time. And please join me in welcoming Lee Dugatkin to the app. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a delight to be here. I've been looking forward to this. And my time here has been just a pleasure getting to know the students and seeing some old friends and making some new ones. And I really appreciate the, appreciate the Athenaeum having me here and Priya setting it up, and I've been looking forward to this all day. So I'm going to start my talk by asking you a question. Suppose that you could build the perfect dog. What would be the key ingredients in your recipe? So you definitely want cute. Maybe floppy ears, a curly tail that wags in joy whenever you're around, You'd want smarts, loyalty, and you'd certainly want unconditional love. The thing is that you do not need to build this animal because for the last 60 years, a dedicated team of Russian geneticists in Siberia have been building it for you. The perfect dog, except that it's not a dog at all. It's a fox a domesticated fox. They built it in the brutal minus 40 degree winters of Siberia, and they built it in the blink of an eye in terms of evolutionary time, a hundredth of the time that it took our ancestors to domesticate wolves into dogs. This is my friend and colleague, Ludmila Trut. Ludmila recently turned 83 years old, and every day for the last 58 years, including today, she has been leading what's come to be known as the silver fox domestication experiment. For the last seven years, I've had the honor of working with Ludmila in order to try and tell this story to a very, very broad audience. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to tell you about foxes that will melt your heart and lick your ears, just like this guy did five seconds after they put him into my arms 
in Siberia. And at the same time, I'm also going to tell you about cutting edge science that, that, that has made us completely rethink the process of domestication. And this is really important because domest when we began domesticating animals, that had a revolutionary effect on our own evolutionary history. So for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to try and summarize almost six decades of work with these domesticated foxes. And it all begins with this fellow right here, Dmitry Belayev. In the late 1930s, Belayev was a college student at a place called the Ivanova Agricultural Academy outside of Moscow. And he was studying genetics there. And of course, because this was an agricultural college, he had all sorts of experience with domesticated animals. After he graduated there, like almost every Soviet male of that era, he spent about four years fighting in World War II. But after that, Belayev landed a position as a research scientist at a place called the Central Research Lab for Fur Breeding Animals in Moscow. And they worked with all sorts of animals here. But the two key species were foxes and minks. And that's because fox fur and mink fur were two of the rare, reliable sources of Western money coming into the Soviet Union, and they desperately needed that money. And it was while Belayev was working at the Central Research Institute that he came up with the idea that would eventually turn into the silver fox domestication experiment. And here's what happened. Because of his own experience working with domesticated species and because of his reading, he knew that a lot of domesticated species share many commonalities. So when you look across domesticated species, you tend to see things like floppy ears, curly tails, mottled fur patterns, low stress hormone levels, juvenilized faces, longer reproductive periods than their wild ancestors. And you see this, you don't see every one of those in every domesticated species, but you see most of those traits in most domesticated species. So Belayev knew this, but he found it perplexing. And it was perplexing because he thought, you know, we have domesticated animals for all sorts of different reasons. Some, like horses, we domesticated for transportation. Others, cattle, pigs, we've domesticated as food sources. And yet others, dogs, for example, we've domesticated for companionship or protection. And yet, despite the fact that we've domesticated them for such different things, we tend to see these traits, the floppy ears, the curly tails, the low stress hormone levels. That whole suite of traits has become known as the domestication syndrome. And Belayev asked, why? Why do we keep seeing all these things in our domesticated species? And his hypothesis was this. No matter what our ancestors were domesticating for, transportation, food, companionship, the one thing that they always had to have was animals that were pro-social towards humans. You cannot have your domesticated species trying to bite your head off. So Belayev hypothesized that all major domestication events in evolutionary history began with our ancestors choosing the calmest, tamest, most pro-social towards human animals. He further hypothesized that all of those other traits that I talked about in the domestication syndrome, that somehow they came along for the ride, that somehow they were genetically connected to tameness. He didn't know how, but that was his working hypothesis. So he decided he would test both of those ideas in real time and run his own experiment in domestication using foxes. And the protocol would be incredibly simple. Foxes breed once a year, so every year is a generation. And the protocol would go like this. He would test lots and lots of foxes and gauge them on how calm, pro-social they were towards humans. And then he would preferentially breed the animals that were calmest and tamest. And then he would test his hypotheses. First, do they, over time, become more and more domesticated? And second, do they begin to show all of these other traits in the domestication syndrome? Do we see 
strange color patterns? Do we see curly tails? Do we see longer reproductive periods? But Belayev has, has a problem. So he comes up with this idea late 1940s, early 1950s. And the problem is this, that any experiment in domestication is an experiment in genetics. But at this time, it was illegal to do Mendelian modern genetics in the Soviet Union. And the reason for that is this fellow here, Trofem Lysenko. So Lysenko was a charlatan, a pseudoscientist, who had risen up in the ranks of both the scientific hierarchy in the Soviet Union and, just as importantly, the political hierarchy. What Lysenko claimed was that modern Mendelian genetics was bourgeois science being promulgated by wreckers and saboteurs, and that instead, an idea that had been long disproven in biology, for the biologists out there, an idea known as Lamarckian inheritance or the inheritance of acquired characteristics, long before this proven incorrect, Lysenko said that not only was that correct, but it was more in line with Soviet philosophy. And so what he did was he made up data that made it look like he was right. And this allowed him to rise up both in the scientific and the political hierarchy, so much so that he literally became Joseph Stalin's right-hand man on science. This is a talk that Lysenko gave where he, stand up, where he stood up there and railed against Western geneticists as saboteurs and wreckers. And after the talk, Stalin stood up and yelled out, bravo, comrade Lysenko. Before Lysenko's time, the Soviet Union was a powerhouse in genetics. But once Lysenko took over, thousands of Soviet geneticists lost their jobs. Hundreds were thrown in prison. And about 20 or so were murdered by Lysenko's thugs for doing Mendelian genetics. Dmitry Belayev knew this, but this was a guy who had spent many years on the front in World War II, and he wasn't going to let somebody like Lysenko stop him, even though he knew better than most how dangerous this was, because one of the 20 or so people that was murdered by Lysenko was Belayev's older brother, who had been an, a rising star in genetics. But Belayev decided he's going to do this anyway. He's going to be really careful, because he knows that to do this experiment, he's going to have to have people help him. And he doesn't want to put those people at risk, but he's not scared himself. So early 1950s, he wants to do the experiment, but he's still got this job at the Fur Institute, and he doesn't have the time or the money yet to start a full-blown experiment. So what he does is he works with a colleague of his in Estonia who is at a fox farm where they're breeding foxes for their furs. But he talks his colleague into letting him work with a couple of dozen foxes, where he'll select the calmest foxes and breed them, but a very small sample size. Yet, after a couple of years, the data you know, doesn't have a lot of power yet, but it looks like it's working. They're seeing slightly calmer foxes, even after two or three generations. His big break comes in 1959, when he is given the opportunity to become a vice director at a new institute in biology that was being built in Novosibirsk, Siberia. What happened was that Khrushchev and a number of leading scientists decided to build this place that became known as Akademogordak, or the Academic Village. So they cleared out a huge chunk of Siberian forest, and over a few years, they built two dozen world-class science institutes, everything from the biology one that Belayev was involved in to chemistry, physics, early computer science. So now Belayev's going to move there, and he knows that he's going to have the power and the money to start a full-blown experiment in domesticating foxes. But what he's not going to have 
is the time to be the person on the ground leading the experiment day to day. He's simply going to have too many administrative duties to do that. So, right before he leaves Moscow to move there, he goes on a search to find a young scientist who can lead this experiment. And the search focuses on Moscow State University, one of the finest university, universities in the world and also one of the most beautiful. And Belayev has a friend there who studies evolution and behavior. And he tells his friend about his idea that every generation he'll just breed the, the calmest foxes and he'll test these hypotheses. So his friend puts out the word and Belayev starts interviewing people. And one of the people he interviewed was Ludmila, who at the time was 25 years old and just finishing her undergraduate work. And Ludmila walks in there, and of course she's incredibly nervous because Belayev is already famous, and she's just finishing her undergraduate work. And the first thing that strikes her is that in this very patriarchal scientific establishment of the Soviet Union at the time, Belayev immediately treated her as an equal. And he looked at her, and Ludmila remembers this as if it happened yesterday. She said, he told me he wanted to make a dog out of a fox. He explains the experiment. Every, genera every generation will choose the calmest animals. Then he tells two things to Ludmila that really stuck with her. The first one was that even though everybody knew this, he felt obliged to remind Ludmila how dangerous this was. Even though Lysenko wasn't quite as powerful as he was in that slide I showed you before by, in 1959, he was still dangerous enough that if he decided to make an example out of them, he could toss them in jail for doing this. Right? Ludmila knew it, but she was touched that Belayev went out of his way to make sure to say this. And the other thing that he told her was, I started this little pilot experiment. It, it's going okay. We don't have a lot of, uh, we, don't have, we have a small sample size. I think this is a really important experiment, but I'm not sure. What's more, even if I'm right, even if this is important, this is a domestication experiment. It could take a long time. It could take 10 years. It could take 20 years. It could take your whole life before you find something interesting. But she was sold on the idea. She thought it was a path-breaking experiment, and she loved the idea of moving, moving to this new academic village in Siberia. Belayev likes what he sees. He offers, her, he offers Ludmila the position, and about six months later, Ludmila and her husband and their two-year-old girl hop on a train from Moscow to Siberia, no easy journey, and start the full-blown silver fox domestication experiment. So when she gets there, there is this institute of biology that Belayev's now in charge of, but what there isn't is an experimental farm where they could run the domestication experiment. Instead, at the start, Ludmila is going to have to do the experiment somewhere else. Now, because there was so much money in fox furs, there were literally hundreds of fox farms around the Soviet Union, all owned by the government. So Ludmila would take trains all over the country to find the perfect place to do the experiment. All along from day one, Ludmila's motto comes right out of the little prints that you become responsible forever for what you've tamed. And so as she's going around to these fox farms, this is her attitude. She finally, at the end, decides, after sampling many, many farms, that she's going to work at a place called the, Lex, the Lesnoy Fox Farm, which is about 225 miles south of where the academic village is. By the way, if I step away from the microphone, can you hear me okay in the back? No, thank you, okay. So she decides on the Lesnoy Fox Farm to do the work, and what's, what she's going to do is, four times a year, she's going to go down there to work with the foxes, sometimes for a couple of weeks, and sometimes for a couple of months. The Lesnoy Fox Farm was gigantic. It was a cash cow, the government owned it, and at any given time, there could be 10,000 foxes there. And Ludmila goes down there and she talks to the director and she says that she wants to do this experiment where they're going to tame foxes and domesticate them. And the director looks at her like she's nuts. Why would anybody want to waste their time doing that when there's so much money in breeding them for their fur? But Ludmila says, Dmitry Belayev sent me and he wants this experiment done and 
The director then said, fine, okay, you can test a few hundred foxes every year, it's not going to bother me. So Ludmila starts the process. It goes like this. Every morning at 6 o'clock she gets up and she moves methodically from cage to cage and she's assessing the foxes on how calm, how tame they are. And she's going to test every fox twice, once when they're a pup and then once when they're an adult. And she's going to gauge their calmness at different points along a path that she's taking. So she's going to rate them as she approaches their cage. How calm are they on a scale of one to four? Or how aggressive are they? On the same scale, how calm or aggressive are they when she stands by their closed cage? Again, scoring them when she opens the cage. And then finally, scoring them again when she puts something inside the cage, either a stick or her hand in a very thick protective glove or a piece of food. And she's always giving them a score of one to four for each of these steps, and she's testing them twice. And what she's going to do then is she's going to get an aggregate score for hundreds of foxes in a given year, and then she's going to choose the top 10% of the males and the top 10% of the females based on calmness score, and those individuals are going to be mated and produce the pups for the next year. Early on, Ludmila describes these animals as fire-breathing dragons. They were very close to wild foxes, and most of them right, were very aggressive. And the ones that scored highest on that tameness, calmness score, they were better described as not especially aggressive. As, uh, that, that's initially what calm was. Whatever variation existed, she chose those that showed the, com the highest scores, but they weren't particularly calm and social. They were just the calmest and social of the early bunches of foxes. There were a few exceptions. Even after a couple of years, some of the foxes, like this fox here whose name is Laska, were calm enough that Ludmila could actually pick them up and hold them and pet them, like she's doing right here. Now, Laska was a little bit of an outlier. Most of the foxes, 99% of the foxes that Ludmila tested at Lesnoy were foxes that were born at Lesnoy. Laska was actually a descendant of one of the foxes from the pilot experiment. So she, had, she is already the result of a number of generations of selection for calmness. But nonetheless, just a few generations, five, six generations. So Ludmila's thinking, you know, if we can get Laska after just a few generations, then the experiment really has hope. So every year she does this, and as time goes by, about four or five years, she's getting enough variation in their calmness that she has to come up with some sort of additional grading scale. And so she begins to classify foxes this way. Class three foxes run away from experimenters or they're super aggressive and they never get chosen as the parents for the next generation. Class two foxes allow themselves to be picked up and held, but they don't show any emotional response to humans. And they too are not calm enough by this time to make the cut as parents for the next generation. Class one foxes are. They are friendly, but they're also displaying whining behavior when humans leave them, and they're wagging their tails when humans approach them. And these are the foxes that are making that top 10%. The next year, she sees a jump in calmness and has to come up with yet another class that she refers to as the class one or the E or the elite of the tame foxes. And this is the way Ludmila describes them. Keeping in mind, this is only generation six of the experiment. There appeared pups that eagerly sought contact with humans, not only tail wagging, but also whining and whimpering and licking our hands in a dog-like manner. Very, very calm, just six years later, six generations of breeding. But what's more, they weren't only tail wagging. They were wagging their curly tails now. A small number of the domesticated foxes had curly tails. 
one of those traits that's part of a domestication syndrome, but was never seen in, fox, in wild foxes. After six generations of selection for behavior, they're now starting to see these other things in the domestication syndrome pop up. Only a small percentage early on, but as time goes, you're seeing much higher percentages of animals who have this curly tail that they wag. A couple of years later, Belayev gets money in space and builds an experimental farm where they can move the work right to Akademogorodok or outside of Akademogorodok. This is what it looks like on a nice day in the Siberian winter. And each one of these sheds holds about 50 foxes. So now, Ludmila and her team can work on this experiment every day. They're not restricted to four trips, even though the trips might be weeks or months, but now they can do it every single day and work with the foxes, giving them a lot more power. The other thing is, in addition to being able to work with them every day, now Belayev can come and see what's going on. He was simply too busy to get down to Lesnoy very often. But now he could come visit, interact with the foxes like he's doing here. And what was especially important to Ludmila was if something important happened, if something really special occurred in the experiment, she could immediately call Dmitri to come over and look at it. And one of those really special things that happened was meshta, which means dream in English. Meshta was the first of the fo domesticated foxes who had floppy ears. Now, yes, I know. So um, uh, uh, typically, when a fox is born, their ears actually are droopy till they're about six weeks old. And then they shoot ramrod straight, the way that you picture a fox in the wild. At six weeks, Me Me Meshta's ears were still drooping. At eight weeks, they were. At 12 weeks, they were. At 16 weeks, they were still drooping. At 20 weeks, they were still drooping. When, when Belea saw this, Ludmilla remembers him looking at her and saying, what kind of wonder is this? Now, another one of those domestication syndrome traits was occurring. Not only do they have calm foxes, they've got calm foxes, some of which have curly tails and floppy ears. Belea used to take Meshta's photo, a slide, to talks he gave all over the country about what they were doing. And people would literally accuse him of taking a dog puppy, putting it up on a slide, and telling them that the fox experiment was working. That's how much Meshta looked like a dog. The experiment's going on year after year after year, and they're measuring all sorts of things. By the mid-1970s, so about 13, 14 generations into the experiment, they're finding that the domesticated foxes have dramatically reduced stress hormone levels. 50% lower than wild foxes. What's more, based only on selection for behavior, they're beginning to see these things pop up in the domesticated foxes. Their pups open their eyes a day early. Domesticated pups respond to sounds two days earlier. When Ludmila takes off her geneticist hat and just thinks out loud, she says it's almost as if they're itching to interact with humans as early as possible. Females, domesticated foxes, are ex have an extended breeding season. This is another one of those domestication syndrome traits. Typically, domesticated species have longer reproductive periods than their wild ancestors. Now, the domesticated foxes, the females, are going into estrus and, and ready to breed a couple of days earlier than normal for a fox, and they continue a couple of days past the short, usually 10-day window in January, February, where foxes breed. They're extending it out a couple of days on each end. Not dramatic, but statistically significant. And yet another instance of a domestication syndrome trait popping up based only on selection for behavior. And they're beginning to see strange coloration patterns like we see in other domesticated species. One in particular was this white star that was appearing on the foreheads of some of the domesticated foxes. And there were other things. So just 13, 14 generations into the experiment, they've got super calm animals who are displaying so many of those other traits that we see in domesticated species. So now Ludmila and Belayev 
are going to expand the experiment. Up to now, they, strict, they select strictly based on how calm and pro-social the animals are. And they're going to keep that part of the experiment going. In addition, they're going to have another line of foxes that are going to be chosen in the exact opposite direction for how aggressive and non-social they are towards humans. Right? Today, you go near those foxes and they will do what you would think someone, what a, what a fox like this would do to you. They'll, they'll, they'll try to rip your head off. The experiment started with an aggressive line in the, in the early 1970s. They weren't so much interested in aggression per se. What they were interested in is having this aggressive line gave them more power to understand the domesticated line. Because for example, if you mate aggressive and tame animals, you can understand a lot about the underlying genetics by studying their offspring and doing all sorts of interesting genetic experiments. But what I want to focus on is another aspect of why they started this line of aggressive foxes. And that's this. This is an experiment in behavioral genetics. And all along, the changes that we're looking at here, the assumption has always been, because all they're doing is choosing on behavior and then selectively breeding, that all these changes are due to underlying genetic changes. But any time you do this kind of experiment, you're always worried that something else is the producing the results you're seeing, something besides changes at the genetic level. So for example, maybe tame, tame pups are relatively calm because they learn it from their parents rather than because it's due to underlying genetic change for tameness. Or maybe tame foxes who are in the uterus of their mom are exposed to a kind of hormonal cocktail that's different than the hormonal cocktail that aggressive pups are exposed to in their mom's uterus. Maybe that affects their behavior. Maybe it's not due to underlying changes in genetics. Maybe it's due to those sorts of things. So Ludmila decides she has to figure out a way to test this. And to do it, she runs what's known as a transplant experiment or also a common garden experiment, except the garden is a fox uterus. And here's, how she, here's the deal. Here's what she does. In this experiment, there are always pairs of animals. And each pair contains a pregnant tame female and a pregnant aggressive female. This is what the developing embryos in the fox's uterus look like. And you know, there are anywhere from five to seven of these. So what Ludmilla decides she's going to do is this. She's going to transplant the developing embryos when they're just one week old. And what she's going to do is she's going to take half of the developing embryos from the tame fox, move them over surgically, implant them in the uterus of the aggressive fox and take half of her developing one week old embryos and put them back over with the tame fox. So that means each one of the pregnant females, ha about half of her litter are her genetic offspring and half are foster offspring. This gives you the power to know whether or not the changes that you're seeing are really due to genetic changes. Because now you can ask questions like this. When the pups are born, do they behave like their genetic mother, or do they behave like the mother whose uterus they grew up in and who might teach them things? Right? If they behave like their genetic mother, the differences are due to genetics. If they behave like their foster mother, the differences are due to something else. Nobody had ever done this kind of very delicate transplant experiment in foxes, but Ludmila said, it needs to be done, so she worked with a veterinarian, she learned how to do it, and this is what happened. She transplants them, she transplants them, right? And so that's good, she knows which one she moved, but she's got a problem, which is this. When mom gives birth, how the hell is she, Ludmila going to know which of those is the foster offspring and which is the genetic offspring? Right? She knows what, when she moves them where everything is, but how is she going to know when they're born? Fortunately, the foxes themselves provide the answer because coat coloration in foxes is 
due to underlying genetic variation. So if you know what color fur the parents have, you know what color the pups have. So you can basically color code the pups so you know which ones are the genetic offspring and which ones are the foster offspring. So let me show you the results of one of these transplant experiments. She did this with, I think, seven or eight pairs, but I'm just going to show you the results of one. And I'm going to focus on the offspring that an aggressive mom gave birth to. Okay? And these are Ludmila's words. It was fascinating. The aggressive mother had both tame and aggressive offspring. Her foster tame offspring were barely walking but if there was a human standing by, they were already rushing to the cage, wagging their tails, and also licking her hands. She, the mother, was punishing her foster offspring for such improper behavior, a great Russian phrase. She growled at them, grabbed their neck, threw them into the back of the cage, and what did they do but get up, walk over to the cage, wag their tails, and lick Ludmila's hand again. They behaved exactly the way their genetic mom behaves, not the way their foster mother behaves. Then if you look at the other side of the coin, and you look at the genetic offspring of that aggressive female, right? here's Ludmila, one of my favorite phrases again. They retain their dignity, growling aggressively, the same as their mother, and running to their nest. So either being aggressive or getting out of there. This is the way aggressive animals behave. The aggressive pups from their mom acted like their mom. The tame pups, even though they developed in the uterus of that aggressive female, and even though that aggressive female was the one who weaned them, they behave like their genetic mom, giving Ludmilla real confidence that the changes they were seeing were due to genetics. OK. So by this time, the mid-1970s, it's clear the experiment is working. Hyper calm, tame foxes, showing all those things like curly tails and floppy ears and color patterns and so on. So Ludmilla decides she wants to push the envelope. She wants to see just how far down the path of domestication these foxes have come. And what she wants to do is she wants to know how they would behave if they lived with humans the way that we live with our pets. So Ludmila decides that she wants to work with a tame female and live with her 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for weeks, months, maybe years, the way that we live with our pets, and more importantly, the way that our ancestors lived with proto-dogs, and see how the domesticated animals behave. She's going to have a journal. She's going to take detailed notes on everything they do. This is a sample size of one, yet it has huge potential for helping us understand what's going on. So she goes to Belayev with this idea. And she says, there's this little house on the experimental farm, and I want to move in with one of the tame females. And what's more, I'm going to want to move in with a tame pregnant female. And when she gives birth, those pups, from the minute they're born, will have interactions with me and other people who come to visit. The way that dog pups, the way that other domesticated pups live with humans. So Belayev loves the idea. And Ludmila has the perfect fox in mind. The fox's name is Pushinka, which means tiny ball of fuzz. And Pushinka, from the minute she could walk, was the most calm, social, tame fox that Ludmila had ever seen. And so she waited a year until Pushinka had been mated and was pregnant, and she's going to move into the house with Pushinka. Here's the only picture we have of Pushinka being petted by Belayev in the winter. Again, this is the house, and it still exists today, 40-something years later. But of course, inside of it today, it's rubble. Okay? Despite that, when I was there, and it was minus 35 degrees, and there were five feet of snow on the ground, Ludmila insisted that she take me into the house, 
walk me from room to room and tell me this is where Pushinka and I used to play ball. This is where the pups would roll over on their back and I would pet them. She took notes on everything. She lived there constantly. So she moves in and a week later, this is the way it was planned, Pushinka gave birth to six pups including one named Pushak, which is the male version of Tiny Ball of Fuzz. And here is Pushak playing with a ball. Ludmila would go out and play with them in the yard. She would take them on walks, either on a leash or not. They would respond to their names. They would sit by the window if she went out of the house and wait for her to come back. And she took notes on all of this. So time goes by, about three months go by, it's July. And Ludmila had lived with Pushinka and the pups for for a while now, right? And what had happened was the house became famous in and around Novosibirsk. It became known not as Ludmila's house, but as Pushinka's house. And Belayev would bring VIPs to visit. And some of the VIPs were scientists and others were Russian generals that Ludmila would watch them melt when Pushinka would jump into their laps. And many people had come to visit. And in all that time, Pushinka and her pups had never acted in an aggressive way towards any of the humans that Belayev or Ludmila had brought into the house. Then something happened on the night of July 15th that Lud Ludmila remembers to this day. Okay, so now it's July. This is what the house looks like in the winter, but in the, in the summer, it can get to be 90 degrees in Siberia. And so every night in the summer, Ludmila would sit on this little bench that was outside the house, and she would read a book. And Pushinko would be our, by her side, and Ludmila would be petting her. And around 6 or 7 o'clock, a um, night watch person would come around and patrol the farm to make sure everything was OK. And that night, there was a new watchman. And the new watchman was approaching Ludmila and Pushinka, you know, relatively quickly, in what might be interpreted as a somewhat dangerous, aggressive way. So Ludmila is reading a book. Pushinka sees the night watchman, and she gets up. She bolts towards the night watchman, and she starts barking at the night watchman exactly the way that a guard dog barks when they protect their master. And Ludmila thinks this right away. But then she says, OK, wait a minute. I know how easy it is to start thinking that animals have human emotions. Be careful here. We don't know what's going on. But then something happened that convinced her that Pushinka really was standing up to come to her defense. And that was this. When Ludmila began talking to the night watchman in a calm way, and Pushinka could sense that Ludmila was fine and Ludmila was not in danger, Pushinka just walked back to the bench, sat down, and waited for Ludmila to come back and pet her. From that day, Ludmila says she knew that she would be working on this experiment for the rest of her life, and she certainly has. I just want to take the last few minutes to walk you through some of the other amazing things that have happened in this, in this experiment. I mentioned to you before that in the mid-70s, they had seen that the domesticated females were breeding a little bit longer. They started a few days early, they, they ended a few days late. Again, we see this in lots of domesticated species. In 1983, something remarkable happened. Typically, the females go into estrus in late January, early February. That year, females, some of the tame females went into estrus twice. The normal time in late January, and a second time in early September. They were ready to mate a second time. That year, no males would mate with them. But the next year, again, just a handful of the elite domesticated females went into estrus a second time in September. That year, some of the males would mate with them. Ludmila bred them, and those domesticated females gave birth to two separate clutches in the same year. Just take a second and think about how radically changed the reproductive system must have been for them to be able to breed a second time, unheard of in wild foxes.
simply by breeding every year for behavior this domestication syndrome trait of not only having a longer reproductive season, but actually breeding twice occurred in the domesticated, in a very small number of the domesticated females. In the 80s and 90s, the foxes were beginning to look eerily dog-like. When Ludmilla and her team started doing detailed measurements, morphometrics of their face and their body, what they were finding was that the domesticated females had much rounder facial features. So one of the things you think of when you think of a fox is this really pronounced snout. But the domesticated females compared to the aggressive females and compared to wild foxes have a much rounder, more juvenileized face. What's more, they're, they're chunkier and lower to the ground than a typical fox. So besides the snout, maybe the most salient feature of a wild fox are these really gracile, thin legs that they run around on. The domesticated foxes have chunkier legs, and they're lower to the ground, much more do dog-like, you know, specific dog breeds, right, than fox-like. One thing that Ludmilla is always doing is looking for collaborators who can help her probe some new aspect of the domestication process. And so when the molecular genetic revolution was in full force, Ludmilla began working with people to understand at deep at the molecular genetic level what's happening as a result of their domestication process. She works with a woman named Anna Kukova, and they do all sorts of interesting genomics work. I'll just tell you one of the things they looked at. One, one thing was a very kind of broad scale question that was this. If you look at the domesticated fox's genome, are the molecular genetic changes that we can locate, are they kind of scattered all over the fox genome or are they clustered in one part of the fox genome? So that was their first question. And what they found was that not all of the traits associated with domestication were located on fox chromosome 12, but a lot of them were. This was a hot spot in terms of molecular genetic change associated with the domestication traits that they were seeing. So that's kind of interesting. It's not spread all over the genome. It's kind of localized. But what's more interesting is this, that at the same time Ludmila and Anna were doing this experiment, People who work in dog genomics were doing the same exact experiment on dogs, asking, are those changes associated with domestication localized, or are they kind of all over the dog genome? I don't want to bore you with technicalities, but basically, dogs have more chromosomes than foxes. But what you can do is you can locate the fox chromosome, and it's spread over three different dog chromosomes. So for the biologists here, these dog chromosomes are homologous to fox chromosome 12. The key thing is that a lot of the molecular genetic change associated with dog domestication occurred at one of the dog chromosomes that was the equivalent to fox chromosome 12. So even deep down at the molecular genetic level, what they were doing with the foxes really was mimicking the same process that occurred when wolves were domesticated to dogs. Now, the last trait that I'm going to talk to you about. And before I tell you what the trait is, trait is, let me tell you why it's so important. The first thing is, as you'll see in a moment, it's hard to imagine a trait that you would that, that's more perfect for your pet to have than what I'm about to show you. The other thing is that this trait did not appear in the domesticated females until somewhere around the 45th generation of the experiment. So if one of your colleagues or professors worked today on a system for 20 years or 25 years, they would be given a Lifetime Achievement Award. If they had worked with the foxes and stopped after 25 years, they never would have seen this. If they had stopped after 40 years, they would have never seen this the power of long-term experiments. What's more, think about what that means for how critical it is for this experiment to keep going on. 
Because who knows what new trait will appear in generation 75 or generation hopefully 150. We don't know. We do know that even after 40 generations, new things were appearing. OK, so what is this new trait? Ludmila worked with a colleague of hers, Svetlana Gogolova, in Moscow. And they were studying the vocalizations, the sounds that these foxes made. And they studied the sounds that domesticated foxes made. And they studied the sounds that aggressive foxes made. And they studied the sounds that wild foxes made. And they studied thousands of hours of tapes of these sounds. And what they found were, was that there were two sounds that almost all of the domesticated animals made, but none of the other foxes made ever. These sounds are unique to the domesticated animals. And here's what they sound like. <laughs> If you take that sound and you put it onto a spectrogram that you can see what it looks like, if you match it up against the human laugh, there is no animal sound that is closer to human laughter than the sound that these domesticated foxes make. It's hard to imagine something you would more like to have in your pet than not only a calm, friendly animal, but a, a pet that'll laugh along with you. Right? Now, this is, a tr this is probably the, the trait that they know least about, because it's only been in existence for a, a little bit of time. And they're still trying to understand why the foxes do this. But nonetheless, it's remarkable that they do. <laughs> so if, sorry about that. If you asked Ludmila today, 58 years after the experiment started, what her hopes and dreams are, she'll tell you this. First, she'll tell you that I want to be able to register them as a new pet species. There are a couple of dozen of these foxes that actually live in people's houses. They're very expensive, and the money goes right to the experiment to keep it going. But there's only a couple of dozen of them around the world. And part of the reason is that they are technically still considered exotics. Apparently, there is a very long process that occurs at the international level where animals are certified as house pets. And Ludmila wants that to happen for the foxes. Of course, there are plenty of foxes to keep the experiment going on and to put plenty in houses as well. Right now, you know, if you lived in Claremont, you might or might not be able to get a, a, a domesticated fox. But if you lived in the town next to this, they might have a different set of regulations about whether you could have a fox. It's really spotty. But once they're considered house pets, that problem goes away. And they can really start doing what one of their goals is, is to create a new pet. Of course, to understand the science of it. But once they've got something that's truly a pet, get it into houses. Keep the experiment going, but get it into houses. The other thing that Ludmila will tell you is, one day I'll be gone, but I want my foxes and the experiment to live forever. I do, and I hope you do. And I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you very much. We'll be opening it up for the question and answer. Please raise your hand if you have a question. As always, priority goes to students. Hi, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. My name is Jennifer. I'm a sophomore at CMC. And I'm just really grateful for uh, just imagining the sheer magnitude of the time and effort that you must have put in to compile this research. Um, I was wondering, you talked a lot about um, just, <laughs> oh, so cute. Oh, <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to take the, okay, the, the just, spotlight off you. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more about how you got involved with Ludmila and uh, uh, her story. Uh, the story was absolutely wonderful, and I was just wondering how you were able to get in contact with her and just maybe talk about the story. Thank you. Sure, sure. And I'll start by saying working with her for the last seven years has been the most incredible experience I've ever had in my life. Um, so how did it start? Well, I mean, my training is in evolution and behavior and genetics. And so if, you're, if you take graduate classes in that area, you come across the Fox experiment a little bit. So there might be you know, a half an hour discussion of some of the important findings. 
But um, Ludmila in 1999, when the ex so there were a couple of times in the experiment's history where they were this close to having to shut it down because they had no money. One time was when the Soviet Union fell, and another time was when the ruble dramatically fell in the late 1990s. And at that point, Ludmila wrote the equivalent of an SOS article that appeared in a popular science magazine called The American Scientist. I read that. I understood better some of the work they had done. And I also began to think that there was a lot more to the story than what Ludmilla had space to write about. That there must have been incredible things going on behind the scenes for 60 years. Things that they tried that didn't work. Things that worked but we don't know about because they're in Russian. Little spin-offs like the story of Pushinka. That's never in a journal. It's a sample size of one, but it really teaches us something. So I, I didn't know about Pushinka then, but I, I, really, I thought there's got to be these, these incredible behind the scenes things going on. So uh, a few years after that, I contacted with Mila. I dropped her an email. I told her um, you know, what I do that I had been more recently interested in the history of science, that I had written sort of popular books for, for people to pick up in bookstores, and I would love for as many people around the world as possible to know about this story. Would you be interested in working with me on this? And what I learned over time was that Belayev, who I talked about, who was Ludmila's mentor, he died long ago. But he, the one thing that he wanted to accomplish that he didn't was to write a popular book about the Fox experiment. And that had always been Ludmila's dream to honor him. And so when I contacted her and said, would you like to do this? She said, yes, I'm very interested. We began talking with each other through email mostly. Um, we decided, yes, we're going to give this a try. Um, we were able to get so far on email, and then it became very, very clear that I needed to spend time over there getting to know Ludmila, getting to know all the workers, interviewing people um, who had worked on this experiment 50 years ago. And so I went there, and I'll tell you, this experiment has almost mythic qualities at the institute where, the, where it takes place. This is the shining example of the science that came out of this, this institute. And so what that translated into was that I told Ludmilla, I, I'd like to talk to as many people as I can who were involved in this experiment. And when I got there, we had days and days and days of people coming in. And these were people who had not been back to the Institute for 30 years, that were in their 80s, some of them in their 90s. But when they heard that we were going to tell this story to the world, they wanted to help. They wanted to tell me anything they could about Belayev, about Ludmila, about maybe w one of the times they went to the farm. And so it all began to come together then. And, and over the years, um, you know, we've become very, very close. And uh, like I say, I mean, Ludmila is the most remarkable person I've ever met in my life. It, you know, the notion of devoting your entire life, 58 years of research to one project, it's, I can't imagine it happening starting today. I mean, it, it's just so unique. And she has this combination of qualities, not just a brilliant scientific mind, but just think about the, the sort of basic everyday logistics that are involved in keeping 700 big furry mammals alive to run the experiment for 60 years. I mean, she's, she's got all the skills you need to do it, and I don't know anybody else who does. Okay. Thank you for coming to talk to us today. It was a really interesting talk. Um, My pleasure. Quick curiosity question. So uh, a vast majority of these foxes are never bred again, it seems like, are used. Uh, what happens to them? Um, and my second question is, uh, you said the uh, researcher really wants to turn these into pets, and you did have that one little print slide. I was wondering if you, you thought of the ethics of creating a new pet uh, in general, and then specifically creating a pet that uh, was evolved in Siberia, uh, and you know, there are all these dogs and cats and shelters and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so the first question is, uh, what about all the foxes that aren't, part, aren't, aren't breeding for the next generation? Uh, some of them 
are involved in other experimental work that they do um, that, that's sort of not directly related to the domestication experiment. Some of them are pit pets in houses. Um, some of them are used for kind of educational purposes when people vis visit the farm. But the, the truth is that a lot of them are um, uh, eventually end up as fox furs. I mean, th th that's one of the sources of money that keeps the experiment going. And I, I will tell you that they, they, this is something that profoundly affects them. So I talked to Ludmila about this. And it's very, very difficult for them when they have these foxes that don't make that cut. The, the, the ones that do get sold to places that, that, that turn them into furs, it, the workers have a tremendous, tremendously difficult time with it. Some of them have to seek psychological counseling for it. It's, it's, it's such a scar. But it, is, but it is true that that's what happens. It's sort of a nasty side, side effect of what they're doing, um, which is certainly connected to the ethics question that you raise later. It's slightly different. In terms of the ethics of breeding a new pet, well, look, I, um, the only way... As I said at the beginning, domestication was a critical turning point in our own evolution, right? I mean, when we domesticated plants and then when we began domesticating dogs and domesticating other species, it radically changed our own evolutionary history. So it's an important thing. The only way to really understand it at the deep level that we saw here is to do an experiment like this. Whether or not that is ethically acceptable, I think is going to depend upon what your set of ethics are, right? If it's the only way to really understand this, then they felt as though that justified doing the experiment. Keeping in mind, again, that they treat these animals extraordinarily well, that many of them they develop relationships with, that they care about them. What do you, you know, what, what do you say about, well, you're creating a new, uh, a new pet species when there are dogs and cats in shelters. At this point, we're not talking about that many animals. Whether or not in the long run they become a true domesticated house pet, then when population sizes grow, I guess you have the same problem you have when, 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 um, when people work to create new dog breeds or new cattle breeds or things along those lines. I don't have I don't have a overarching ethical justification for it in terms of meta ethics. I can just tell you that the experiment was important enough that they felt that if they acted in a respectful way as they did the experiment, it was worth the sort of things that we've been talking about. Hi, um, I, I really love the talk. By the way, it was incredibly fascinating. Um, I, I love dogs, so I, Thank you. I, I had to sign up for it. Um, uh, you mentioned earlier in your experiment that uh, minks were involved uh, towards the beginning. Minks, the the, or towards the beginning of the experiment, they were being considered for it. Um, uh, I was curious what uh, what made them decide not to use the minks, and additionally, uh, what other species could possibly be considered for uh, such an experiment to learn new things about um, evolutionary. Yeah, biology. great question. Great question. So um, when I met, when I mentioned the minks, I I, I was mentioning them in the sense that that was one of the other major species that was at that, inst that fur breeding institute. Um, the reason that they chose foxes was that, um, you know, they were particularly interested in the domestication process that had led to dogs. And wolves, dogs, and foxes are all canids. And so it made sense to, to, to do the experiment initially with a, a, a closely related species. And foxes are way more closely related to wolves and to dogs than, than minks were. Now, it's funny you should mention minks because, in fact, I, on the other side of the fox farm, they have been running a 40-year-long experiment where they've been doing the exact same thing we just talked about with minks. So they did, in fact, do the mink experiment. And they, they, they sort of jokingly say that if the fox experiment is the, you know, is the equivalent of a dog domestication experiment, the mink experiment is sort of closer to cat domestication. And, um, and so, what, so they select 
again, on both ends of the spectrum, so they've got a line that are super calm, a line that are super aggressive, and generally speaking, they find similar kinds of things as in the foxes, meaning lots of coat color variation, differences in the facial structure, lower stress hormone levels, many of the same things that were found in the fox. They, they're, a they're, they're not quite as dramatic because the minks are smaller and they're not as cuddly, but they are, you're getting parallel changes. Just, and th so this was Belayev's hypothesis, that no matter what you start with, if you start with tameness, these other things occur as well. In addition, there's an experiment now that's been going on at the Max Planck Institute, one of the Max Planck Institutes in Germany for, I think, 40 or 50 years on domestication in rats. And that experiment actually started with one of Ludmila's colleagues and one of my friends, a guy by the name of Pavel Borodin, who went around to farms and trapped wild rats and began doing the exact same, select the calmest ones, select. And again, so now we're going down in size even more. And so the, when you look at them, the results are not quite as visually dramatic. But not only are they calmer in the calm line and more aggressive in the aggressive line, just recently, in the last two months, a paper came out that showed facial differences that were parallel to the facial differences that have occurred in the, in the domesticated foxes, more juvenileized facial features, lower stress hormone levels. So those are the th three major experimental domestication uh, experiments that have, that have, occur, have, have occurred. And then there are you know, more anecdotal things. So, th so they've tried it in a number of things. And generally, this is the pattern they find over and over again. Спасибо большое за вашу лекцию. I, I was, got the first part. You're welcome. I didn't get the second. I, I'm, I'm, my Russian is, I know thank you, but I didn't catch the second part. I said thank you for your lecture. OK, thank you. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, how did? Пожалуйста. <laughs> Uh, how did the relationship between the uh, more traditional foxes and the new species change or evolve over time, if it did at all? They have not done a lot. Well, so they've done no work where they actually have the domesticated foxes interacting with wild foxes. But they have done some behavioral experiments where they've put the domesticated foxes together with the aggressive foxes to watch their interactions. And that has actually produced some very counterintuitive results. So if you think about it, okay, so the domesticated foxes, they have really low stress hormone levels. They've been selected for calmness and tameness. And the aggressive foxes have been selected the opposite way. And that's exactly the way they behave towards humans. But when you put them together, there are no differences in the way they interact with each other. So a priori, I might have thought if you did that, you would see the aggressive individuals being very behaviorally dominant and aggressive towards the tame foxes. But that word aggressive is specific to the way they interact with humans, not the way they interact with other foxes. So that's really bizarre because, you know, the tame foxes do have really low stress hormone levels, really low corticosteroid levels. You would think that that would sort of bleed over into their interactions with aggressive foxes, but it doesn't seem to matter at the fox-fox level, only at the fox-human level. Yeah. Hi, thank you for uh, speaking with us tonight. Uh, I have two questions. My first question is, are there any indications as to why these certain traits show up in the, do the domestication syndrome? And my second question is, how common, if at all, are <coughs> there anomalies in the breeding, like any glaringly tame in an aggressive litter or any glaringly aggressive in a tame litter of fox? Sure, sure. Well, let me, th let me answer the second one first. Um, basically, how much variation is there within a litter? Plenty. OK, now, uh, so. I, I, you, I, it's, it, it would probably be very uncommon to find, for example, elite, tame, and super aggressive pups in the same litter. But that said, you would certainly see variation with some of them perhaps being extremely calm and extremely prosocial, and others maybe being less so, and some being relatively neutral. Maybe some are slightly aggressive. I doubt you'd see the most aggressive in the same litter as the most tame. But there's plenty of variation at the genetic level still. Same, 
both for the tame litters and for the aggressive litters. They're predominantly the type that their mother was, but there's plenty of variation along that spectrum, even in the kids, which makes sense because this is all probably being controlled by lots and lots of different genes. Now, the first question is a great one, and if I had two hours, I would have told you the answer during the talk, but the question was, how, why is it that we consistently find all these other domestication syndrome traits appearing? The leading hypothesis for that comes from the developmental biology literature. So what happened was evolutionary biologists began looking at the literature that developmental biologists had published on a particular type of cell known as the neural crest cells. Neural crest cells um, migrate along what's known as the neural crest very early on in development, and they migrate into almost every organ of the body, and they're involved in a tremendous number of different traits as in developing organisms. So here's what it looks like it look like what looks like it's happening. This is not from experimental results. This is from looking at massive reviews of all the literature. The literature suggests that when you select for behaviors like tame behaviors, you change both the number of neural crest cells and basically the the um, the uh, pathway they take along the neural crest. You, you change the migratory behavior of these cells as they migrate to different organs, and you change the number of the cells when you select for tameness. At the same time, all of those migrating neural crest cells are linked to almost every one of those traits in the domestication syndrome. They're linked to anatomical, anatomical traits like snout, the, the shape of the snout. They're linked to uh, more uh, hormonal traits like corticosteroid levels. They're linked to um, anatomical things like fur coloration. And so the idea is that by selecting on tameness, you change fundamental things about the way neural crest cells act. And because they affect all of those other traits we just talked about, you see changes in anatomy, hormones, fur coloration patterns as a byproduct of what you've done on, by selecting for behavior. That's the leading hypothesis today. Yeah. Hi, thanks for coming out. My pleasure. Um, so my question is, you hear a lot now about like the degradation of certain dog breeds, and most people point their finger at inbreeding, and the two traits that are brought up the most is that pushed in snout and yeah. stubby legs. Right. Uh, but that came up in your talk just about uh, domestication and kind of what you were just talking about. Do you think then that maybe inbreeding isn't the whole answer, and maybe that just this domestication just leads to the more rounded pushed in snouts and shorter legs, or do you think maybe inbreeding played an impact in the fox experiment? Okay, so what I can tell you for sure is that inbreeding did not play a role in the fox experiment because from day one, these are population geneticists and their whole protocol was designed to avoid inbreeding because when you inbreed, you get all sorts of weird things that pop up and you want to make sure that the things are not popping up because of inbreeding but because of the domestication process. So in this case, it's not inbreeding. I actually did not know what you, what you said about um, the, uh, the stubby legs being a result of inbreeding. Um, it's certainly possible that that is part and parcel of, of domestication per se, although, I, you know, so I'm, I, I'm not quite sure how to get from there to the inbreeding that they're doing that might produce that, but, um, you know, it's certainly possible that domestication per se has something to do with the stubby legs. So I don't know whether or not in those inbred lines, maybe they're inbreeding for super calmness or super tameness, and that might then sort of magnify the stubby leg phenomenon that's also somehow linked to inbreeding. I, you know, I'm, I'm not certain. I'm not certain. Um, there was something else I was going to say that you, you made me think of, but um, I, can't, I can't recall it right now. Yeah. Please join me in once again thanking our speaker. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure.